Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning's message, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, is taken from the Gospel lesson, and that's uh, going to kind of serve as the hook to get us to, to where we want to be here uh, this morning, uh, with special emphasis on the 14th verse of the 14th chapter of Matthew's account of the Gospel, uh, where it simply once again reads, Then he, that is, Jesus, went out, and he, uh, when he went ashored, uh, ashore, he saw a great multitude. He saw this huge crowd that had gathered, and, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. This is our text, dear family and friends in Christ Jesus. Amen. Today what we're going to do in this uh, message is spend some time together looking at uh, different miracles of Jesus. And we're going to allow today's gospel lesson, uh, which is the account of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, as I mentioned, to serve as a hook uh, to get us to, to be where, where we want to be here this morning uh, as we look at uh, the different miracles that Jesus performed. And with that being said, what I'd like to do here this morning uh, when I first get started is to say that, that uh, this morning I'm, I'm, I'm operating from the understanding that we all know and we all believe that, that Jesus was not only capable, but that he also did perform these miraculous signs that are, are recorded in Holy Scripture. Now, that may seem to be a little bit obvious. Some may say, well, duh, Pastor. Uh, but sadly, we live in a day and age where that really needs to be said where we come from the perspective and a clear understanding that we're talking uh, about our view with Scripture, that Scripture is indeed the inspired, and errant, infallible Word of God. What we're talking about is that there are absolutely, positively, no mistakes, no errors, no contradictions, any of that stuff found in Scripture. That, that Scripture is indeed 100% God's Word without doubt whatsoever. And so with that being said, with that being the foundation, what I really want to do here this morning is to focus on the question, why did Jesus do the miracles that he did? And uh, today's gospel lesson serves as that springboard, that, that starting point for us uh, as we look at uh, him feeding the 5,000. Now, it's kind of interesting when we look at today's gospel lesson, Jesus feeding the 5,000, that this miracle is the only miracle that is recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's kind of interesting, and I'd encourage you maybe to do this a little bit later on today when you get home, for your own personal devotions, if not today, maybe tomorrow, is to open up four different Bibles if you have them, and, and uh, turn each one to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of their account uh, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And as you read through each different account, you're going to find that each one writes from a different perspective. Each one is written just a little bit differently with a little different emphasis. And that should not come as, as a shock or, or a great concern. Uh, just like many of you, when you sit around the table at different times of the year and retell stories, uh, each of your children and, and each of you remember things differently from a little different perspective. And that's what we find with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's account of the feeding of the 5,000. But it's helpful when we look at each section of Scripture, each of these Gospel lessons and each of the events that they record, uh, that it, it's helpful if we understand uh, where they're coming from, from their point of emphasis, which makes uh, reading it a little bit better understanding as far as why it was written the way that it was, how it was all handled. For example, in Matthew, uh, Matthew's account of the Gospel could almost kind of be seen as, as a bridge. Um, Matthew's readers were primarily Jewish Christians, and you can tell that because throughout the Gospel of Matthew, there are a lot of Old Testament sightings that are found therein, which kind of helps connect the dots for many of those Jewish Christians so that they could see how it all fit together. And so Matthew's account of the Gospel really is an attempt to bridge the gap between Judaism and Christianity. So uh, that's Matthew's emphasis. Mark's uh, emphasis was a little bit differently. Mark was the kind of guy who liked to say, well, well, this is what happened. Mark's gospel is a very fast-paced, uh, moving book. And, and this can be seen, uh, Mark is oftentimes referred to as immediate Mark. 
And that's because uh, you'll find in, in Mark's gospel, a lot of times, immediately they did, Jesus did this. Immediately they did that. Immediately they went there. And so he's the kind of guy who, who uh, is more concerned about what happened rather than when it happened. Uh, Mark's kind of one of those guys, if, if you've ever talked with anybody, they, they start talking here, and oh, and then, then there's this, and, and then there's this, and, and then there's that. And that's kind of the way Mark was. He liked to hit the highlights, and then he would move on. Now, Luke's gospel is a little bit differently. I guess we could almost say Luke's gospel is, is written pretty much uh, for people like us. That he, he shows us that, that Jesus is, in fact, totally 100% God, but yet at the same time, Jesus is totally, in fact, 100% man as well. And this can be seen with the, the different emphasis that is found in Luke's gospel. It tells us that great account of, of Jesus' birth. Then it, it tells of his circumcision, tells about his presentation at the temple, tells about uh, his growth as a child, and, and when he was a child at 12 years old, went to speak with the religious leaders, and so on. So, so Luke kind of presents uh, that, uh, comes from that perspective or that angle. Now, John's gospel is really different from all the others. By the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those are seen as the synoptic gospels, uh, that's a seeing together, that a lot of that stuff is very, very similar. John's gospel is a, is a little bit different. It places more emphasis on theology. Now with that, I, I'm not sure if you ever noticed or caught that before, but, but behind my shoulder over here, this statue over here is John. Okay, and then at the, the feet of John, there you notice that there is an eagle there. Uh, not by accident, not because they had a little extra something that they wanted to fill that in. But John's gospel is identified with an eagle, and that's because John's gospel soars above the other gospels theologically. Uh, John places a great deal of emphasis on theology, and, and we can see that with, you know, it's a little deeper in thought, uh, theologically wise, with that. You can see that when he uses those, those uh, phrases, uh, those great I am phrases. Where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. Uh, uh, I am the resurrection and, and, and the like. So John, he likes to tackle the tough issues uh, when it comes to theology, when it comes to the study of God, who he is, uh, and, and what he's about. And so, though we could still say that each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all contain the Gospel message about Jesus Christ and, and him crucified, and that he came to be savior of the world, and yet each one has a little different emphasis. And, and it's helpful when we understand this, when we are reading these gospels, because then it, it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense why they said what they said, and how it was all put together the way that it was. Another interesting thought is with uh, John's gospel, uh, whenever uh, miracles take place, rather than referring to them as miracles, uh, he will refer to them as signs. And he refers to them as signs as a way to give indication that this miracle wasn't just a miracle to be done, but rather this is a miracle uh, that was done because it has a message, uh, that it, it pointed uh, out a truth that Jesus was trying to make with the miracle that it was that he performed. And, and again, John's gospel, more theological, it was, was not as much chronological as it was theological. And so he arranged all of the events in, in the Gospel of John in, in such an order with a single purpose, and that single purpose was spelled out in John 20, verse 31. This is one of those great passages you probably want to highlight in your Bible. John 20, verse 31, where Jesus said, So these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, John wrote the gospel uh, with the, the sole purpose so that all of his contemporaries and, and us years later on as well, that we would accept that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah that was promised oh so long ago, and that by receiving that, by, by believing in that, then we would be able to receive that precious gift that God wants to give us, that precious gift uh, of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, knowing how each of the gospel writers used each of these miracles of Jesus, I guess we could say is one thing. But knowing and understanding why Jesus performed these miracles, that's quite another. 
Now, obviously, Jesus performed these miraculous signs uh, to, to show that he was, in fact, the Messiah, that he was God, who he claimed to be. Uh, and, but that's not the only reason why Jesus performed the miracles. He performed them for other reasons as well. And so what I'd like to do in this short time that we have together is, is talk about some of those reasons why Jesus did uh, the miracles that he did. Now, uh, one of the most obvious reasons that Jesus performed the miracles that he did was, uh, I guess you could say, out of necessity. Uh, that, that a situation arose, something needed to be done, Jesus was there, and Jesus performed the miracles. And so we, it might even be, well, well duh, isn't that, isn't that obvious? Well, that, that's true, but yet it's important to really understand that. Uh, a great example of this would be uh, Jesus' first miracle uh, when Jesus changed water into wine at, at the wedding in Cana. And, and we all know the story how they ran out of wine, then Mary, Jesus' mother, came up to him and said, you know, we, I, you need to do something about this. And then Jesus responded to her. Listen to what he said. He said, a woman... What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And then his mother said to the servants, do whatever it is that he tells you to do. Now, it's true that, that Jesus did show a little hesitation here, but uh, that was really to drive home the point that Mary had faith in him to be able to do something about the situation in which they were found. Uh, you can see that when she, after Jesus said that, told servants, go ahead and do whatever it is that, that Jesus tells you to do. The end result was that Jesus turned that water, the purification water, the dirty water that was used for cleaning the hands and getting ready for that, uh, into the best wine that the crowd had ever tasted. So, why did Jesus do this miracle? It was basically out of a necessity. There was a need, a situation arose where, where something needed to be done, and he took care of that. There was that immediate need, and, and his mom asked him to do that. Now, there were other times, though, when Jesus performed miracles in, in order to teach. A good example of this, uh, well, so that he could drive home the point that he was trying to make so that there'd be no question what it was that he was doing. A good example of this was when uh, Jesus was on uh, the Sea of Galilee and, and that big storm arose. And, uh, you know, he got in the boat, storm arose, they, they sailed off. Sea of Galilee, not unusual to have these big storms that are out in the sea. Uh, the wind started picking up, the waves started increasing, splashing against the boat. And, and the amazing thing was, in this process, Jesus was asleep in that boat. Uh, and, and then at that point, the, the disciples, uh, they lacked faith, they lacked trust that, that, that Jesus, that God had things under control. So they went in and they, and they woke Jesus up and they said, Lord, save us, we're all going to die. And he said to them, why are you so afraid, you of little faith? And he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and immediately there was great calm. They were marveled, uh, marveled at that, and then they said among themselves, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Now, certainly this miracle pointed to the divine powers that Jesus had, but it was far more than just that. It taught the disciples something about faith, about trusting God when all those different storms of life come your way, that in the midst of the raging winds and the heavy waves that are there, that God is still there, that God has promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Lo, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Uh, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So it was to drive home the point of faith, of, of having trust, trusting that the Lord will always provide no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance. There, was, uh, there were other times, though, when, when Jesus performed a miracle, and it wasn't so much about evoking faith or bringing about faith or, or calling to question uh, one's faith, but rather it was in response to the faith of the individual. A great example of that would be uh, in Matthew chapter 9, when uh, those individuals brought a paralytic on that cot to Jesus uh, in, in order to be healed. And Jesus saw their faith, we are told in, in uh, Matthew 9, and he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. 
Well, needless to say, with that, uh, there, there came an outcry of, of unbelief of what the, the scribes and the Pharisees saying, Who are you? Do you think that you are able to forgive someone's sins? You're blaspheming with the things that you said. And Jesus said, Why do you have these evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say, you know, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? And then Jesus told that paralytic to rise and walk and go his home way. You see, it is because of the faith that it was exhibited in those individuals who brought that young man to them. That was no easy task. Uh, they didn't bring him with the intent that they were going to take him back on that count, but they had, caught, they had total confidence that Jesus would be able to heal. And not only did they have faith, but that man on the cot also had faith that Jesus would be able to perform the miracle and that he would be cured. And we're told in scripture that he immediately took up his bed and he walked. See, this miracle happened uh, as a reminder to all of us the importance of holding on to that faith that God has given us, to trust in him, to, to truly live by faith and walk by faith, knowing that even when the situations seem impossible, that God still provides. And still, there were other times when Jesus performed miracles um, because uh, the situation in which the, the person or, or people were in, it, it really touched Jesus' heart. It, it moved him into compassion. And that's where today's gospel lesson really comes into play. Again, Matthew 14, verse 14 tells us, when he, that is Jesus, went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. This was also echoed in Mark's account of the gospel, and uh, this account of the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 8, where uh, Mark uh, recorded this. He said, Jesus said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have now been with me for three days and have had nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry uh, to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come a far way. You see, it was because of Jesus' compassion on them that moved him into action to meet the need when it arose before them. So it's helpful when we, when we look at all these miracles, when we see what it is that took place, and, and, and it helps start to make sense why he did these miracles that he did. But to help even drive home that point a little bit more, not only is it beneficial to look at why he did the miracles that he did, but also to look at those moments when he had opportunities to perform a miracle, and chose not to perform that miracle. A great example of this would be from Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was in the wilderness, when he, when he was tempted uh, by Satan. We all know the event where, where Satan took him up to the high point, the pinnacle of the temple, said, just throw yourself down. Do you not know that, the, that uh, uh, if you throw yourself down, that he will command angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so you don't strike your foot against a stone? And then we all know that Jesus responded by saying, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, Jesus didn't have to prove anything. There was absolutely no need for Jesus to prove to Satan uh, that he was God. Uh, Jesus wasn't going to just perform miracles on command to show that he was uh, the, the miracle man, the magic man who was able to do all these things. There was no imminent need, and so he did not do it. And, but rather, he waited for the right time, the right event, the right things to take place to do the miracles. Another example of time when, when uh, uh, he chose not to perform a miracle was when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples. We all know that story well. We hear it every year that when they were in there, when they were betrayed by Judas, Peter pulled out the sword. He cut off the ear of Melchus, the high priest's servant. Now, it's true, Jesus did perform a miracle by taking the ear, reattaching that there. That was a miracle that was there. But then Jesus told this to Peter. He said, put your sword back into its place. For all those who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot give appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? You see, he did perform the miracle of healing, but he could have done another miracle by bringing all these legions of angels down to destroy that army and have things under control. Uh, under control. But you see, it's really Jesus' restraint, not his performance of miracles, that give us the reason why Jesus did the miracles that he did. 
He refused to do this miracle of bringing down the legion of angels because it would have been counterproductive to his mission and ministry to be the savior of the world. You see, even though we talk about it, say what could have been, what, you know, how dare they do this and that, all that stuff, like it or not, Jesus had to fall into the hands of the soldiers. Jesus had to die on the cross. For you see, without the cross, there would be no resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would be no eternal life. See, Jesus did not perform miracles so that we would know that he was God. Jesus performed miracles because he was God. He wasn't trying to prove anything. He was just, he was just being himself. And so today, as we pause from our craziness of our everyday life and, and, and come across today's gospel lesson, which is Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, uh, it, it's a great opportunity for us to be reminded of or to think and reflect upon the greatest miracle of all. That is when Jesus was moved by compassion and he miraculously transformed sinful human beings like you and me into his marvelous and amazing saints of his kingdom. Where through that sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, we have then become effective servants of the kingdom. And through, by being called those servants, we then are able to see that, that by compassion uh, our, our Lord feeds us, that he has uh, compassion on us, that he cares for us, that he loves us, that he forgives us. And that as we then have been enabled by the power of the gospel to receive these gifts, you know, it's our prayer that the Lord will then empower us to have compassion on those that he has placed around us so that they too can experience the same hope that we have in Jesus. They can see Jesus in the things that we say and the things that we do so that he may be glorified in everything. So it's my prayer the Lord will bless you as you never forget and always hold on to the greatest miracle of all where God has changed you into his amazing saints for his kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, may the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.